capitalism destroys itself because it becomes too successful. This is the only philosophy or religion in the world that has created widespread wealth around the world. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, December 19th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, December 19th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. As always, if you are new to our channel or if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe. Hit that bell to be notified on updates and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, thumbs ups truly do go a long way for us. Dr. Mark Faber joins us once again today. Dr. Faber is well known for his contrarian investment approach. Born in Zurich, Switzerland, he's studied economics at the University of Zurich and obtained a PhD in economics, magna cum laude. Dr. Faber has written several books, and after working in New York, Zurich, and Hong Kong, Dr. Faber in June of 1990 set up his own business, publishing a widely read monthly investment newsletter, The Gloom, Doom, and Boom Report which highlights unusual investments and opportunities. And we're delighted to have Dr. Faber here once again with us today. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Dr. Faber. Dr. Faber, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. And yourself, I hope so too. And especially your viewers. Yeah, I'm doing great. Viewers are doing fine. I hope so. <laughs> I know they're going to be a lot happier once they get to see you. You got that nice... Chris Kringle, <laughs> Santa Claus look going on again. My, my Sunday dress. <laughs> looks great. Looks great. You know, uh, Dr. Faber, from your, your homepage on your website, gloomdoomboom.com, front and center is something that philosopher Joseph Schumpeter said. Uh, Schumpeter was asked the question at the American Economic Association in 1950, themed the march into socialism. And he was asked, can capitalism survive? His answer was, no, I don't think it can. Dr. Faber, this was in 1950. What in 1950 was leading Schumpeter to believe capitalism was going to fail? Actually, if I recall, he had his speech in November 1949. I would have to check precisely. And he then died about three or five months after he gave that speech. But he had dealt with the subject already in this book in Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. That's the first time we dealt with, and that was, I think, in the, like in 1942. But at the speech, he reiterated his view that capitalism was unlikely to survive for a variety of reasons. Okay, did he point out any specific reasons? Yes. Uh, basically, capitalism <laughs> destroys itself because it becomes too successful. Uh, this is the only philosophy or religion in the world that has created widespread wealth around the world. If you go back 5,000 years of history, never has the poverty rate been this low as it is at the present time. Now people say, yeah, the Bezos and uh, Zuckerberg and all these people and Bill Gates are very rich and we are poor compared to them. Never mind they are rich because Better they are rich and you have a decent standard of living than that everybody lives in misery like under socialism. And it is uh, uh, disturbing for me that so many young people and even older people have never been in a socialist country and seen the disaster of socialism as it existed before essentially the opening of the world in the 1980s. It began with the open door policy in China in 1978. 
And then with the breakdown of the Berlin War in uh, 1989, and since then, many countries, not just one, many, every country that was previously socialistic, communist, after introducing market reforms, uh, the standards of living everywhere and for everybody went up without exception. There's not a single exception where the standards of living after introducing free market reforms and the capitalistic system where the standards of living went down. Yes, in China there are huge wealth differences between the richest and the poorest. But better live with these wealth inequalities than in misery. But Schumpeter, he pointed out that these wealth inequalities would lead to a lot of uh, bad sentiment. Furthermore, he pointed out that as a result of the success of capitalism, Frequently, the management or the corporation would become an entity detached from the owners of that entity. In other words, the owner, Bezos, is no longer working <laughs> for Amazon, but on something else or retiring, but he controls the company through a large parcel of shares or pension funds control the companies through a large parcel of shares or the government or whatever. And he pointed out that these uh, institutions that then hold the shares or wealthy people, but that are no longer involved in the day-to-day -day management, they will develop great sympathy for the demands of the socialists, namely, you know, better working conditions and reducing uh, the responsibility of people and transferring the responsibility to the government through social security and nowadays basic incomes and so forth and so on. So that was one reason. The other reason he said, and this is a very important reason he said uh, and wrote that under capitalism you have a growing army of regulators and academics. These people, they are at universities and so forth, and uh, they dislike basically the capitalist uh, that thrives under Darwinistic system where <laughs> the stronger company eliminates the weaker company and where companies, uh, as a result of the creative destructions, where entire companies disappear and so forth, they dislike that, and they will subsidize them. And so the capitalistic system is attacked from different sources continuously until it will uh, eventually succumb to the likely successor being socialism, that he pointed out. Okay, and these are all internal forces that are eating away at capitalism. Well, we can observe them today. Uh, even very rich people <laughs> give money to organizations like Black Ma uh, Lives Matter, BLM, and so forth, which is unusual because uh, BLM essentially is against private property. That is one of their objective uh, to remove private property. And I have to point out that in many countries they didn't have private property. In fact, uh, property rights is something relatively recent in global history. You know, if you look at 5,000 years of history around the world, uh, well-defined property rights is not the usual condition. It's an unusual condition that came along with capitalism, which was also built aside from property rights. 
on accounting uh, principles that allowed a corporation to exist and so forth. So capitalism is not something a man one day said, oh, I discover a better system, it's called capitalism. The many factors that came together that allowed capitalism to come up. And it's interesting that all these uh, cultural war theories and so forth, they overlook one important fact. The only place in the world where capitalism came up was Western Europe. The only place. Not in Africa, not in the Americas and uh, in the empire of the Incas and so forth, not in Asia, nowhere, only in Western Europe. That's where the birthplace of capitalism occurred as a result, A, of the discovery of the double book entry system the introduction of money as a unit of account and also of property rights. And, of course, the entire legal system that comes along with property rights. People always uh, kind of downplay or attack the white supremacists. It has nothing to do with white supremacy, but we had a legal system that functioned, and the British, they're always accused of colonialism and imperialism. At least they brought the world a legal system, and most countries are grateful for that. No country in Asia bitches against the colonialists because they know that the colonialists brought to Asia much more than they took. It's only a distortion of history to speak badly of the colonialists, the Spaniards who discovered the world. What did the Spaniards do? The first thing they did in Mexico, they built the university to teach the people what to do. But the historians nowadays, they all the woke kind of type of uh, pseudo-academics. You know, Dr. Faber, also on your homepage at gloomdoomboom.com, uh, you know that von Hayek, which, uh, who he observed that if socialists understood economics, they wouldn't be socialists. How many generations do you think we are away where capitalism no longer exists in the U.S. or are, all we, are we already here? No. Uh, strictly speaking, among young people, maybe 60%, they like socialism, or they say they like socialism. But the reality is the population is, a, is still larger than just the young people. And so, uh, totally, most people in the U.S. are still in favor of the capitalistic system and the market economy. But, as you know, when uh, polls are announced by the mainstream media, they're always biased. Everything is biased. I don't understand that the media that is owned by rich people is so much against the capitalistic system and so much against Trumpism and uh, distorts the news, distorts history, distorts everything. You know, Dr. Faber, when the history books are written, perhaps decades from now, what will people pinpoint as to being the downfall of capitalism? I think it's a slow process. But definitely, uh, if you look at the 19th century America, it was a period of extremely strong economic growth. The growth rates in America between 1800 and 1900 were much higher than the growth rates between 1900 and today. On a GDP per capita basis, inflation adjusted. 
people in 1900 were much richer than in 1800. And surprise, surprise, Mr. Jerem Powell and Miss Yellen. Surprise, surprise, the price level wasn't any higher. Although the population grew from 4 million in 1800 to 80 million in 1900. Okay, so the price level was the same. And people didn't say, oh, we have inflation. There were inflationary periods, and then there was deflation, and again inflation, and then deflation, and so forth. But people were not so dumb, because they didn't have so many academics, uh, and said, oh, we have inflation because of COVID-19. This is what Miss Yellen said yesterday, okay? Two days ago, yesterday. And... In the, in the 20th century, after the formation of the Central Bank, the Federal Reserve in 1913, and other central banks around the world, what happened? In 1910, government spending as a percent of the economy was not higher. The maximum was around 12% in some European countries. But in the U.S., government spending, all the spending, state, local, uh, federal, government spending as a percent of the economy was 9%, 9. Now it's 44. And it's much better than in France and in other countries in Europe. Uh, Europe is uh, a very socialistic uh, economy. That's why they have no growth. The Federal Reserve and other central banks have, by printing money, allowed the government to grow like a cancer. This is destroying the economy, the capitalistic system, nothing else. Okay, that's a great point. You know, we, we keep hearing how the Fed keeps propping up the markets and you called it a cancer. It has the Fed truly created a monster that it has to keep feeding, otherwise otherwise risk it turning on investors and devouring their investments, their hopes, their dreams, their futures. <laughs> it's a joke. I agree with you. Uh, this will be very interesting to see at uh, what point they will taper I mean, I, 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 my view is the stock market goes down on the major indices, S&P, 15%. The Fed will step in and start easing again. And the history books, they will say, well, the Fed had to ease because of COVID. Nonsense. They started to ease in August, end of August 2019, long because the, before there was a COVID. Maybe Mr. Fauci and the Fed already knew there is COVID, so they started to print money ahead of it. That is not totally unlikely, since these characters, the deep state behind everybody, Maybe they engineered the COVID. So they, that created an excuse for the Fed to print even more. Who knows? We don't know. I don't believe for a minute that the current president is running the United States. Someone behind the scene is doing that for him. Probably Obama is on his third presidential term. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've I've heard a lot of people, a lot of people actually say that. And but you know, with with inflation being not so transitory, the Fed told us it would be, and the Fed says they're going to start tapering in December. Recently, they even said they're going to accelerate the taper. You know, Doctor Farber, last time they did this, we saw the taper tra the taper tantrum. How do you see this taper working out come Q one Q two? As I said, I, I believe what you pointed out just now, that asset markets are so inflated uh, they can't really print too, uh, I mean, taper too much. 
because even at these inflated levels of assets, there is still a large unfunded liability in the pension fund industry, state and corporate, both. So with interest rates at uh, next to zero on deposits, it's a unique situation in the history because in the past, say in the 73, 74 bear market, which I experienced because I started to work in 1970, it's difficult to say so, as people say, oh, he comes from the last century. But uh, in the 73, 74 bear market, interest rates went up to 12% before they started to drop. So if your stock portfolio went down, at least your bond portfolio and say you had 50% in bonds or 60% in bonds or so, they provided the necessary cash flow to bail you out to some extent, not 100%, but to some extent. But nowadays in Europe at 0%. And look, in the US, we have an inflation rate. If it, measured, if, it, if it was measured by the old system that existed prior to the 1970s, the rate of inflation would be 13%, which would include shelter, a much higher rate of shelter inflation than is now reported, and so forth. My sense is that for you and me, the rate of inflation nowadays is between 5 and 10%. That's what I guess. But if a family comes and says, oh, I have two children and so forth, and the school fees have gone up and the insurance premiums have gone up, and in my case, I smoke and drink, the alcohol taxes always go up and the smoking taxes also so my inflation is maybe 10% or more. Uh, also coming up is the U.S. debt ceiling. What do you think is going to happen with that debt ceiling? Or does it even matter anymore? It doesn't matter because it automatically is increased. But it's always increased with the blessing of both the Democrats and the Republicans. And if it's not, if it's under threat not to be increased, then the Republicans come and say, oh, we need some more money for some more rockets or for the veterans or for whatever, for another war, because we need wars to keep the economy alive and to keep the public under the impression that there is a threat to the U.S. so we can spend some more. And if the Republicans are in control of the Senate and the House, then the 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 Democrats will say, well, we need some more money for Ms. Ocasio-Cortez to buy another dress for a charity ball, and we need some more money for the opera house, and we need some more money for the homeless people, because we have to buy tents for them and so forth, and some more drugs so they can, so our pharmaceutical industry thrives, and we need to launch another virus to keep the public busy with something. And so forth, so on. So at the end, the budget, uh, the government expenditures always go up. Always. Relentlessly. And look, if we talk about uh, all these things, as I pointed out, inflation is between 5 and 10%. In America, the 10 years government bond is yielding 2%, okay? In Europe, most countries have 10-year government bond yields of 0 or less than 1%. So, you have a negative real rate of interest, inflation-adjusted interest rates, if you keep your money on deposit, an honest citizen, when I grew up, my grandparents said, oh, the safest is to keep money on deposit with the banks. 
Nonsense. Nowadays you lose 5% per annum. Not because it's taken away, but because the cost of living is going up 5% and you don't get any interest at all, even in U.S. dollars. You know, Dr. Farber, getting back to, to inflation that you mentioned, um, do you think the Fed will actually have to raise rates uh, knowing the consequences that might come with that? Or, or do you think we may see some sort of universal basic income where they supplement people's incomes to help offset the inflation? They'll find an excuse not to increase interest rates. They will say, well, the, we can't because realistically, can you imagine that the Fed <coughs> would over the next six months or one year increase interest rates on the Fed fund to 7%? Out of the question... I mean, your viewers and everybody has to wake up. This is out of the question. And maybe this time is different. But in the past, when you had these kind of negative real interest rates, inflation has accelerated. Accelerated. And also with this, we hear the Federal Reserve talking about central bank digital currencies. Do you think this is the right thing? Or, or at least what's your opinion on central bank digital currencies? My opinion is that the central banks are criminal, criminals. Either they don't know, then they shouldn't be in a position to actually run a central bank because by having a central bank and this the first president under whom a central bank was introduced Woodrow Wilson he was very distraught he was very disappointed that he had to sign that bill he said it's a disaster <laughs> and he saw very clearly that it's a disaster And before, uh, Amschel Rothschild, in the early part of the 19th century, I think it was in 1812 or 1815, he said, give me the control of the money, of the currency in a country. I don't care who makes the laws. The people who control the central bank, they have an incredible power. And Marx, he was actually regarded even by Schumpeter, who wrote a 1,000 uh, page, essentially, history of business cycles in the United States and in Europe. And he wrote also about the history of economic theories. He had a high opinion of Marx as an economist, not as a forecaster, but as an economist, he had a high opinion. <coughs> and one of the points of the Communist Manifesto of 1848 was the creation of a state bank that <laughs> the state controls, in other words, the socialists, they knew that by controlling and allocating credit, you could control the whole economic system. The central bank is a completely uncapitalistic development because in a free market economy, you, ha you would have hundreds of banks and Milton Friedman pointed this out, the banks then issue their own money and the good money will be strong and the bad money will disappear and so forth. It's like nowadays, you have hundreds of cryptocurrencies. 95% will disappear. They will end up with zero value. But one or two will have value. But I doubt the one will be valuable that is issued by a central bank especially not by one that is run by American central bankers 
most of whom come out of Goldman Sachs anyway. That must be pointed out because the mainstream media never says that. But it's like a revolving door between Goldman Sachs, the U.S. Treasury, and the Federal Reserve. Yeah, that is uh, uncontested. That That's truth right there. Yeah, Dr. Faber, we, we heard the words financial reset back in 2014 when IMF head Christine Lagarde uttered those words. Actually, it was economic reset. Are we there? Are we there now or are we in the process? Yeah, I'm glad you're mentioning Lagarde because you asked me about central banks. She is the perfect central banker, a convicted criminal. That is the typical central banker. But the legal system is such that everybody in a democracy can hide between a huge bureaucracy and the good thing about royalty and feudals is if a royal performed poorly, the people chopped off his head and replaced him. Whose head do you want to replace in Washington, D.C.? You would need thousands of guillotines to get through Washington, D.C. Not just Washington, D.C., you understand? It's very difficult to pinpoint in a democracy who is responsible. <coughs> Ultimately, Congress. Yeah, that's true. We've had guys in there for 20, 30, 40 years already. And I think a lot of us, we are expecting some type of a, a crash economic reset, as it's called. Uh, let me ask you, Dr. Faber, what role will gold play in all of this? Well, <laughs> Under normal circumstances, it will hold its purchasing power. But I'm saying this under conditions of a capitalistic system where you have the maintenance of property rights. You understand? If you abolish property rights, and this is one of the objectives of socialism, communism, the uh, abolishment of private property. And, and that Sean Peter pointed out in his uh, speech that uh, what it would mean to become a socialist economy is that most uh, production facilities, most economic factors are no longer owned by, by private people, by private wells but by the state. That's why socialism is such a disaster, because it has been well established everywhere in the world. A system of a free market economy and a system that is uh, where production and consumption is controlled by the government. The government in, in every country, everywhere, inferior to a private property system everywhere. Hey, Dr. Faber, you've given us a lot to think about, and we appreciate that. How can our listeners follow more of your work? Well, first of all, the best, if someone has any doubts about socialism, is to go on a holiday to uh, one of the few remaining socialist countries. They can easily go to Venezuela and see how it works. They can also go to North Korea. And uh, this is not an exception. This was how socialism functioned. It brings a massive corruption, black markets, injustices, criminality, everything. I tell you, uh, I wouldn't wish socialism to my worst enemy. Actually, I don't have enemies except central bankers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, central bankers and uh, pharmaceuticals in the government, <laughs> the pharmacists in the government. Uh, everyone loves you, Dr. Faber. But we will know to uh, go ahead and uh, send them to the uh, gloom, doom, and boom yes. report. So we'll, yeah, we'll make sure to send them there. You, you got a, quite a few interesting articles and um 
you know, I hope we can do this again soon, and I'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Yes, to you and your viewers, Merry Christmas. In some years, in a few years, you won't be allowed to say Christmas because it will be politically incorrect because it's a racist. <laughs> it comes from the uh, white racist supremacists. And, but I, no, nonetheless, I wish you Merry Christmas and a healthy and happy new year. All right, Dr. Farber, we appreciate your time. And again, I hope we can do this again yes, soon. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Mark Farber, publisher of the Gloom, Doom, and Boom Report, sharing his views on the economy. To visit his website, please go to www.gloomdoomboom.com. If you like this video, please subscribe, share, and give us a thumbs up. They really do go a long way for us. Audio-only versions of this interview and others can be found on iTunes and Spotify.